Welcome to another lecture by Medico Medics. Malaria. We will begin the lecture with a general introduction of malaria. We will discuss normal physiology, pathophysiology, symptomatology, diagnoses, differential diagnoses, and treatment. We will go through a brief case example and end with a summary. And for our med students, we recommend stopping and looking at our high yield review. Now, malaria is a life-threatening infectious disease caused by plasmodium parasites. They are transmitted to humans through the bite of infected Anopheles mosquitoes. Clinically, malaria is characterized by cyclic fevers and chills, reflecting the parasite's life cycle in our red blood cells. Now, patients often develop anemia, due to the destruction of these red blood cells. Now, in severe cases, malaria can lead to complications, such as cerebral malaria, which affects the brain, and multi-organ failure, both of which can be fatal if untreated. Now, there are five species of plasmodium known to cause malaria in humans. The most dangerous among them is plasmodium falciparum, it's responsible for the majority of severe cases and deaths worldwide. Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale are notable for their ability to cause relapses. This happens because these species form dormant liver stages called hypnozoites. And these can reactivate weeks or even months after the initial infection. Now, plasmodium malaria usually causes a more chronic and mild form of the disease. However, lastly, plasmodium nolacy is a zoonotic species, meaning it normally infects animals, but can also infect humans, and it has the potential to cause severe illness. Now, it's estimated that about 241 million cases appear globally every year, with Sub-Saharan Africa carrying the highest burden. And vulnerable populations include children under the age of five and pregnant women. These, are at, these groups are at increased risk of severe disease and mortality. Now, to deepen our understanding of malaria, it is important to examine how the plasmodium parasites affect key organs and structures, particularly how they affect our red blood cells and the liver. Now, our red blood cells carry oxygen via hemoglobin, and they have an estimated life cycle of around 120 days in circulation. It is also important that RBCs remain deformable and flexible to be able to travel through capillaries. We also have the liver, mainly filtering blood and removing pathogens, but also producing clotting factors and detoxifying metabolic waste. Now, how are these important in malaria? Well, malaria parasites spend a significant part of their life cycle inside of these red blood cells. So normally, red blood cells are smooth, biconcave discs, as seen here in these illustrations. And this structure helps the RBC to travel easily through our blood vessels and efficiently deliver oxygen. But when infected by plasmodium, the shape and function of RBCs can change dramatically. So in malaria, for example, with plasmodium falciparum infection, the RBCs can become sticky and Ill irregular in their shape, and this can lead to blockage in small blood vessels. This is a major cause of complications like, for example, cerebral malaria. Furthermore, the parasite destroys the red blood cells because it multiplies inside of them. And this leads to the anemia we see clinically in malaria patients. Now, the liver plays a critical role in the malaria life cycle. Why? Because when a mosquito injects plasmodium sporozoites, these first travel to the liver, 
And this is where they then invade our liver cells and multiply silently before entering the bloodstream and affecting our red blood cells. So the liver stage is crucial because it's the window when the infection is asymptomatic but expanding. Now let's focus on the pathophysiology of malaria. So it all begins with the mosquito bite. An infected Anopheles mosquito bites a human, injecting sporozoids into our bloodstream. The sporozoids then travel to the liver where they invade our liver cells or hepatocytes. And here they begin to replicate. So the sporozoids multiply and mature into merozoites. And when the liver cell bursts, these merozoites are now released back again into our bloodstream. Now moving along in our bloodstream, these merozoites will infect our red blood cells. And while they are inside our red blood cells, they undergo asexual reproduction all of which leads to an even higher level of merozoites. Eventually, the cell is ruptured, so these merozoites are now released. And when this happens, due to the synchronized rupture of our RBCs, we see cyclic fever. Now you can also see this illustrated right here, where we have the infected primary mosquito biting a human, Releasing its sporozoites, these enter our liver cells, maturing into merozoites. The liver cell bursts and they are released into our bloodstream. These then infect our red blood cells, undergo asexual reproduction, and the cycle continues. Now another interesting and important point is that some of these merozoites undergo further development. So some of these merozoites develop into gametocytes, both male and female forms. So now we have circulating gametocytes in our blood. And when another mosquito bites this person, it can ingest these gametocytes. And inside the mosquito, these gametocytes fuse and mature. So now this mosquito has become infected and it can fly off and infect someone else. And so the cycle of malaria continues and spreads. Now let's review the common symptoms of malaria and what they mean for the patient. Now the hallmark symptom is fever, which occurs in cycles as the parasites, if you remember, multiply and rupture our red blood cells. Furthermore, patients can experience headaches, common sign of systemic infection. They may report dry cough due to mild irritation in the respiratory tract, although malaria primarily affects the blood and liver. Liver enlargement occurs because the liver is one of the first organs invaded by the parasites during its life cycle. And the liver works hard to filter infected cells and clear toxins, so this can lead to enlargement. Another symptom can be nausea and vomiting, so signs of the body's reaction to um, infection and inflammation. And this can also result from liver involvement. We also have chills and sweating. These are typical during the fever cycles. These chills happen when the body temperature spikes and sweating occurs as the fever breaks. Back pain and muscle pain reflect the systemic inflammatory response and the destruction of red blood cells, which affects muscles and joints. Finally, Spleen enlargement happens as the spleen filters and removes infected and damaged red blood cells from our circulation. And this can cause discomfort and increase vulnerability to rupture in severe cases. So by understanding these symptoms and their underlying causes, we can better recognize malaria early and provide effective treatment. Now here we have the pathophysiology connected to the related symptoms. So if we have red blood cell rupture and toxins release, we should see cyclic fever, chills, and sweating. If we have hemolysis, so the burst of red blood cells, we should expect severe anemia. 
and symptoms of tachycardia, pallor, and fatigue. If it's liver involvement, we expect jaundice and elevated bilirubin. What about capillary blockage? So, in more severe malaria, typically by Plasmodium falciparum, we can see cerebral malaria. So, confusion, seizures, or coma. And multi-organ dysfunction, like acute kidney injury, or respiratory distress, or liver dysfunction, etc. Now let's take a look at a case example. So we have a 32-year-old male returns from a trip to Sub-Saharan Africa with a history of fever every two days, chills, sweating, and fatigue. He also reports headaches and abdominal discomfort. His vital signs, fever 39.5 degrees Celsius, mild pallor. Lab results reveal elevated bilirubin, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. We do a blood smear and we find the presence of plasmodium falciparum trophozytes. So we have confirmed malaria. Now, the fever every two days which is the tertian pattern, is occurring due to synchronized red blood cell rupture and the release of merozoites. Like we mentioned, with the release of merozoites, we will have a triggered cytokine release. So we will have an inflammatory response to it. What about the underlying uh, causes of headaches and abdominal discomfort. Well, it results from systemic inflammation and possibly from splenic or liver involvement. Naturally, due to hemolytic anemia from the destruction of infected and uninfected RBCs, we will see mild pallor. Cause of elevated bilirubin. Well, hemolysis increases the levels of unconjugated bilirubin in our blood. Due to RBC destruction and bone marrow suppression, we will see anemia. And what about thrombocytopenia? Well, it's common in malaria, likely immune-mediated due to splenic um, sequestration. Now, let's turn to the diagnosis of malaria. So we do microscopy, thick and thin blood smears. Thick smear will detect parasitemia. Thin smear helps identify species and stage. We can also do rapid diagnostic tests where we can detect plasmodium antigens, especially plasmodium falciparum. Additional testings could be PCR used in specialized settings for species confirmation. And of course, CBC, where anemia and thrombocytopenia are common findings. And let's briefly take a look at some differentials here. So we have dengue fever. It is characterized by retral orbital pain, rash, and a positive NS1 antigen. However, it lacks cyclic fever. Furthermore, dengue fever is caused by a virus, a flavivirus. So it's not a parasite like malaria. What about typhoid fever? Well, it presents with a stepwise fever progression and with abdominal pain, confirmed by positive blood cultures. It is also caused by a bacterium, not a protozoan parasite like malaria. And the causative agent of typhoid fever is Salmonella typhi. What about sepsis? Well, it involves uh, generalized signs of infection, but without parasitemia on spear, uh, smear. It is most often bacterial in origin, commonly gram-negative bacteria, so not a parasitic infection. And finally, leptospirosis. It features fever, myalgia, but leptospirosis is caused by a spirochete bacterium. So again, not a protozoan. Now, how do we go about treating and managing malaria? So if it's uncomplicated malaria, which refers to symptomatic malaria without signs of severe disease or organ dysfunction, and of course with the patient able to tolerate oral medication, then we give ACT, 
which is artemisinin-based combination therapy. If it's caused by P. vivax and P. ovale, we add primaquine to eliminate liver hypnozoids. But here is an important clinical tip. Make sure you test for glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency first. Now, if you're wondering, like I did, why do we check for glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency before given primaquin? Because, first of all, primaquin is an anti-malarial drug used to eliminate the dormant plasmodium vivax and ovale liver forms called these hypnozoids, right? These are the ones that cause relapses. However, primaquin can cause oxidative stress in our red blood cells. So in people with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, their red blood cells lack enough of this enzyme to protect against oxidative damage. So when given primaquin, these individuals with the deficiency can develop acute hemolytic anemia, where their red blood cells will break down rapidly. Therefore, testing for glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency before prescribing primaquin is actually very crucial to avoid this potentially severe side effect. Now, what about severe malaria? Well, in severe malaria, we give IV, artestinate, which rapidly clears parasites in severe cases. And of course, supportive care like fluids, blood transfusion if needed, renal support. Then of course, we have monitoring, where we do daily parasitemia check to confirm clearance. Now there are of course, many other ways to deal with malaria, mainly prevention. There are chemo prophylaxis, so travel, travelers to endemic areas can be given doxycycline or mefloquine, etc. Uh, there is available vaccination, mainly approved for children in the endemic regions. I think it's RTS, Moscurix, or something like that. You can use insecticide-treated nets or ITNs for vector control. You can use repellents and avoid outdoor activities at night as a personal protection. Now, there are some very severe potential complications of malaria, like cerebral malaria, right? Seizures, altered mental status, even coma. Severe anemia due to the RBC destruction and bone marrow suppression. We can have uh, kidney failure resulting from hemoglobinuria and reduced perfusion, etc. So in summary then, causative agent is plasmodium parasites transmitted via Anopheles mosquitoes. Symptoms can include cyclic fever, anemia, and even organ damage. We diagnose it with blood smears or rapid detection tests. Treatment acts or IV artesinate for severe cases, and primaquin for relapses. Prevention, mosquito control, chemoprophylaxis, vaccination. Potential complications include cerebral malaria, kidney failure, and severe anemia. And here we arrive at our high-yield review of malaria. If you're a medical student, we recommend taking a pause here to study. And that's the end of the lecture. Thank you for listening. Please share, like, and subscribe for more weekly videos.